We were thinking very long and hard about what to do about our anniversary issue. And I have made a very big thing over the years of not celebrating anniversaries, always making the point that one should look forward rather than backwards. The whole way that we look at fashion today has shifted so dramatically. There was a sense, certainly when I first came to Vogue, that people were a little bit embarrassed by it. And fashion is so universal now. It has sort of been embraced by everybody. But to me, that's what's so interesting about fashion, is that fashion is a reflection of our times. Fashion can tell you everything that's going on in the world with a strong fashion image. And the people responsible for the fashion images in Vogue are the fashion editors. They have always been our secret weapon. So it seemed to me that we could celebrate Vogue, celebrate the history of women, and also at the same time celebrate these great editors. And they're really the, the producers, the directors, the psychiatrists, the, the writers. They are really the people that produce these great famous images that Vogue has such a rich history of. When you're enjoying your favorite magazine, you ever wonder what went into its making? Come behind the scenes. This is a meeting of the editorial staff to plan the new issue. What does a fashion editor do? Well, a fashion editor uh, is really Alors, a fashion editor do a lot of work, meaning... Not a lot. <laughs> fashion editor doesn't do very much. <coughs> Let me just think about this. You don't know now, I guess you never will. <laughs> Haven't you spoken to everybody? I didn't even know that they existed. I can't answer that question. It would take too long. Uh, it's, it's about making an image. But how we get there is, is almost impossible to explain. Essentially what you're doing is collaborating with a photographer to create an image that reflects the fashion you're trying to capture and also hold a mirror up to the zeitgeist of the moment. Your memory of fashion really is an editor's vision of fashion through a captured image. It's iconic fashion images that you remember. Your memory of fashion really is fashion photography rather than fashion itself. They give us access to another world. They give us access to dreams. You know, it's like reading a book about a life that you'll never occupy. But that's the beauty of being transported. Well, it makes you dream. I think when you read Vogue, it's a big fantasy every month. It's our way of living in a different realm for a short period of time, and how beautiful is that? In the studio, the fashion editor sees that those ideas are worked out in terms of pictures. It was a more intimate process half a century ago. But the fashion editor's role has remained exactly the same. The fashion editor, seeing that everything's just right, model strikes a pose, the photographer says, hold it, and the camera clicks. The extraordinary thing is that each of the fashion editors at Vogue has a completely different take on fashion, a different personal aesthetic, a very different sense of what they want a fashion photograph to say and to express. Oh, so you haven't written it? Okay, okay. okay. Grace Coddington obviously is the unassailable fashion editor par excellence. You know, I like kind of lighting it up with a pink colored pan or something. She has an extremely romantic, sort of poetic vision in a way. She likes her 
stories to have a narrative thread. And then there's always going to be something sort of magical about the way it's presented. She comes from a very small town in Wales. Growing up, she used to adore Vogue. I mean, I don't think that anyone but Grace can create the kind of photography essays that we do. She's unrelenting in the pursuit of the image that she wants, not a redhead for nothing. It was my idea to do Alice in Wonderland. You know, all those fairy stories are quite dark, actually. They're all full of drugs and darkness and things like this. And so they're interesting to illustrate because it's not just Walt Disney suite. It was Anna's idea to cast all the designers as the characters. It was really the beginning of a time when the designers were starting to become such superstars themselves. Now it's, it's kind of matter of fact that Mark Jacobs will get mobbed in the street. It wasn't like that back then. She wanted me to play the caterpillar smoking hookah, right? And I had torn a tendon in my finger. So I was like, Grace, I just went through this operation. Do I really have? And she was like, well, there's no other dates and you've got to do it. And originally I said no. And then I got a call from Grace. Then I got a call from Anna. You know, you can never say no to Grace. We shot it with Natalia, who's a really favorite model of mine. Did my eyes just lit up? Did you see that? <laughs> uh, I'm a big, big fan of Grace. Just even watching her work is fascinating. It's really like storyboarding a film. Grace looked at every possible book on, you know, different drawings of Alice in Wonderland, different editions of Alice in Wonderland. Grace sent me the books to read before I did the shoot. Months of preparation, of research, of conversation, and then I am the lucky one who ends up in the picture. She's stepping through the mirror, and somehow everything was back to front. She's stepping through the mirror this way, and all the ruffles and detail was here, and the camera's here. So she said, can we put this dress on back to front? And I said, no, we can't, actually, no. And, you know, I saw Nicolas Gesquier from Balenciaga going slightly pale. I remember Grace looking at me and said, can you do something? And I was like, OK, how long do you give me? And she said, half an hour. I said, 45 minutes. And it was a very fancy dress. It was very intricate with all these crazy ruffles in the back. And we went to the van. And he took it completely apart and put all the ruffles on the other side. And we shot it. But, <laughs> but it was. Oh my God, it's back to front. It's like, oh. Well, it's the mishaps that make it fun and, you know, brings you the surprise. I mean, you know, God forbid that a, that a shoot would be perfect. Grace wouldn't have anything to complain about. <laughs> Fashion is such a fairy tale and it is such a fantasy. And it is about metamorphosis and sort of changing yourself and playing a part that you want people to see. Do you feel that there's something of a metaphor about that fairy tale for the fashion world? Not really, no. No, sorry. <laughs> you can't lead me there. No. <laughs> Back when the magazine first began, it was very much a social magazine focusing on the women of society. Then it was all illustration. Really wasn't until Condé Nast bought it in 1909 that he changed the focus much more on women's fashion. And he first introduced photography, shooting not only society women, but fashion as well. Lee Miller, another of the magazine's stars, is busy on one of her features, which bring readers glimpses of what's going on in foreign lands. Lee Miller had had this extraordinary relationship with Vogue. She was one of the most beloved models in the magazine, and eventually to take photographs herself. 
She wasn't a fashion editor per se, but her extraordinary career shows how front and center women have always been in shaping the magazine. At one point I was gonna make a film about Lee Miller and she came alive during the war. What's actually tragic about it is that in that chaos was when her art form came to life. The most shocking image that I've seen is the Lee Miller reporting that came back when the Second World War ended. This is the Buchenwald concentration camp in Weimar. I guess it was kind of a brave decision of the editor to publish those pictures. They're certainly not the sort of images one expected to see in a fashion magazine and was a turning point in Vogue's history. It really marked a dramatic break with the past. America was a very, very different place after the war. It was just the photographer and me, and that was all. No hairdressers, no makeup people, no Metro-Golden-Mayer epic production. There was an outfit from Balenciaga that we wanted to photograph, and the girl is to run up the steps and the scarf is to fly in the breeze. Well, the scarf didn't fly, and the girl was tripping up and down. And I was desperate, I didn't know what to do. So I finally tied a thread to the scarf and I ran up the stairs behind the girl, waving the scarf in the breeze. It really took Greenland in the 60s to shake things up, most dramatically. Diana had a very vivid way of expressing herself. It was all vibes and images and, I mean, girls used to come out of her office. What did she say? <laughs> I had that reputation of not being easy, but naturally I expect someone to do as much work as I do. Anyone who thinks otherwise must be insane. Greenland expresses a whole kind of giddy, liberated, crazy youthquake moment of the 60s. I wanted to get where the action was. What's it like to fly in a jet? Jet planes had just come into our lives. And Diana decreed that the December issue was going to be an issue of wonders. Because in the old days, if you wanted to go to Egypt, you didn't go for a weekend, you went for several months. But with the jets, you could go any place. So the first trip we made was to India. And of course, India in September, which was immediately after the rains, was a sauna bath. We get to this hall of gods and heroes, and they didn't mind at all that we were climbing all over, as long as we did. The only thing was you couldn't wear shoes. Leather, of course. This is in Istanbul. I seem to have spent a great deal of time looking for camels, or Henry would say, what we really need is a camel. And thank God, over the horizon would come somebody leading a camel. It was brand new to show these places. Nowadays, there's a road up to the top of this mountain, but then it was an adventure. And on the way down this terrible mountain, little corporal said, are you Peace Corps? I say grandly, oh no, not at all, we're Vogue. I used to say I was the spoiled brat of the fashion world, and I was. <laughs> but I worked very hard and loved it. Oh, my God. Oh, God, Polly. I have to say the truth. Brutal. It was brutal. I mean, absolutely brutal. The fashion department was just a no-go zone. I mean, assistants would be in tears night after night. Things would be hurled around the offices, but, you know, Polly herself was just an extraordinary powerhouse of pizzazz, and she just understood perfectly that balance of fashion, photograph, 
telling you about the clothes, but telling you so much more at the same time. When you've been through the Polly Mellon School of Sittings, you are never the same again. It was my first shoot at Vogue, and Mrs. Vreeland said to me, is my passport in order? Because we want you to go to Japan with Dick Avedon. And I was like, oh. All the other editors wanted this plum sitting, and it was given to me, this new person on the block. It was called the Great Fur Caravan. I traveled with 15 trunks. We were there for five weeks. I mean, how fast are sittings done today? Three days? It was the most expensive trip ever done at Vogue and never will happen again. <laughs> I love this picture. Our lovely warrior, Barushka. I mean, giving it her all. I realized from the other editors, there was some jealousy, and I spoke to Mrs. Reland about it, and Mrs. Reland said, Polly, who needs friends? Get on with it. There's a certain loneliness to being a fashion editor. The most important thing being to bring back the pictures that will make the difference. I was called into Mrs. Reland's office, and Grace was standing by, and they embraced me and clapped, and I cried. <laughs> I am quite an emotional person. It was wonderful storytelling, beautiful Avedon pictures. The clothes, as wonderful as they were, never were bought by stores. They were just not, in any sense of the word, about today. The reader was changing. The clothes were changing. Everything was changing. And suddenly, fashion magazines, nobody seemed to be buying them. There's no question I thought everything we were doing was excessive. I was extremely upset when Mrs. Reland left. And so I talked about the office going beige. I gave the impression, I think, now we're dealing with mediocrity. When I became editor, the whole staff was asked to come down and meet me. And I talked about ease in dressing, ease in motion. I had a vision for something for a modern woman in the middle of the women's movement. Polly Mellon put up her hand and said, Grace, I'm the one person who doesn't understand what you're talking about. Could you go through it again? Polly intuited immediately that there was a very different era with Grace Mirabella, who didn't want fantasy. She wanted fashion stories that were informational, that were really useful to the readers. It started out as a fragrance shoot, and it turned into a very sexual shoot. When I would go to market in the West Indies, I was always conscious that the women sat in a dress pushed down between their knees. And when you talk to somebody like Helmut Newton about something like that, he takes it farther. I mean, has she, is she going to or has she done it? Has it happened? What is the story here? This is something that Vogue had never shown before. The woman was always the object of desire, you know. And suddenly you had a woman who was clearly thinking about sex and had <laughs> powerful, lustful thoughts. And it was kind of incredible that that was sort of captured in a picture. I mean, it, this all sounds so insane to be saying now, but I mean, in the context of what came before, it was really radical. Trouble. <laughs> Here comes the trouble. The famous picture in the baths. It was certainly a very, very unconventional way of presenting clothes. Bathhouses in the mid 70s had <laughs> so many connotations. I don't know where to begin, really, but. Um... 
As each girl came on to the set, it began to turn into something very special. I mean, Deborah took each girl separately and explained what she wanted. There's a, a disconnect from one girl to the other. It's not happy. It's very thought-provoking. It's a little surreal. We got a lot of letters of people who didn't like them, like my own family, who thought they were unnecessary and unpleasant and taking advantage of women in a sad situation. I, I never saw that. And I think that sometimes you have to take a risk. My first day at Vogue, I'd been living in Paris, and I had my nail polish done in red, and I had a little Hermes bag at the time. Everybody else was dressed in pants and flats. Polly Mellon said to me, where do you think you're going dressed like that? You're going on a sitting with me, and you're gonna be unpacking what we call coffins. And you're not gonna be able to run around with red shoes and a white crepe dress. Go home and change. When I started at Vogue, it was the real era of the working woman. I know that sounds so archaic now. In the 70s, the whole world started to look at the American working woman and what she symbolized and change in the way everybody looked at the role of women. All eyes really, I think, switched to the United States and because of that, American Vogue. So that was a huge, huge switch. Women were coming to the working place. Unfortunately, they were wearing sneakers with their suits. I remember French people were laughing. It was a caricature of an American woman for French people. So we tried to encourage women that you can feminize a suit, you can still be stylish, you don't have to look like a man. So I ended up doing, you know, a lot of suits. You know, you have to think a lot to restyle a suit constantly. And it was a Doberman brought in in this series to tug on the dress. Well, he actually started to want to bite Christy. This was not Photoshopped. In those days, there was no such thing. The trainer kept feeding him steak, huge amounts of steak to the dog. And then he grabbed the dress and ripped it to shreds. Ripped Jeffrey Bean's heathered gray jersey, see, I still remember, to shreds. <laughs> That's always been the attitude of Vogue Sittings editors. Anything or everything for the picture. Our working woman didn't look like any man in a gray flannel suit. It was anything but boring. I used to wear little binoculars so I could check details, you know, of what the photographer was, was seeing. I have a pair around my neck here. And I, oh, I think I had a camera, too. Before I went to Vogue, I loved taking photographs. And, you know, as soon as I started working with the greats, that was the end of that career. This was a shoot with uh, Chris Van Wagenheim and Patty Hansen. We kind of grew up together, Patty and I. Um, Patty was our model of choice, I would say. Everybody loved Patty. Patty Hanson was the embodiment of what the magazine was all about. The great, gleaming, white teeth, blonde haired, all American, sporty, attainable beauty. She was the golden girl next door. It so happened that she had just fallen in love with Keith Richards and she decided to bring him along. I've never taken a boyfriend on a trip. You know, I tell my daughters, don't do that. You, you know, do your job and keep your personal life separate. Here's Patty, and Keith was right over here. You know, it was his guitar strumming. You know, serenading her as the shots were being taken. And it was romantic, and it was crazy, and... Um... And I wish I had the photos from that time. You're gonna show me a shot. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh 
<laughs> oh my goodness, I wish I looked like that now. I could start the romance all over again. I mean, they were, they were so in love. It was, it was almost embarrassing to <laughs> We were in Los Angeles, and we'd already started the shoot, and we were doing fashion, just kind of fashion pictures. They were okay. And I said, do you have any special things that you like? And she said, I like snakes. I said, you like snakes? So we called an animal place, and they brought that incredible snake. I held the snake which is quite an experience. And Dick said, would you do it in the nude? And she said, yes, sure. And she lay down and the snake wound around her body and up her body and got to her ear and kissed her. And he took the picture and I had tears rolling down my cheeks. I couldn't believe it. It was magical, completely magical. When the snake kissed her ear and the tongue went into her ear, the shoot was over. I mean, we couldn't speak. It was absolutely extraordinary. I wish I hadn't put that bracelet on um, because I thought it became kind of a fashion statement and I thought the picture was something else. I would have liked her to be completely nude. This, of course, was the time of Ronald Reagan and the Christian right, so the Adam and Eve reference couldn't have been more timely. But um, I don't think this is a biblical reference. <laughs> It's outrageously phallic and throbbingly sexual, don't you think? You know, it's not just about fashion. It's, it's, it's about culture, it's about Hollywood and liaisons. At the time, of course, Elizabeth Taylor was promoting her perfume, and so she was very committed to presenting a very specific image of herself encased in a sort of shellacked high Hollywood glamour. When I spoke to her, I said we really wanted to do you as you haven't been seen. Get very casual in sweaters and khakis or something on the beach. The wind in your hair. Well, the next day, several limousines worth of Dior's, hats, shoes, bags. I mean, the total opposite of what <laughs> of our concept, and she had a totally different idea. Where passion rules, how weak does reason prove? You'll see. And, I mean, a gale wind could not move her hair. It was kind of a nightmare. For the very last shot, I said, could we wrap a towel around your hair and take you down to the beach? And she said, okay. And just before Wayne was about to shoot, I grabbed the towel and pulled it off her, off her hair. And that's, I mean, you can see it in her eyes. She was so angry. I mean, I really thought she was going to punch me and screamed, you know, how dare you? And I thought, boy, you know, but she looked amazing. So when she sent me a signed print, I was floored. It ended up being her favorite shot. Thank God. <laughs> Well, my father told me that's what I should do, and I was very influenced by my father, so. I was very interested in what I saw going on in fashion, which was a high-low mix of fashion that was happening at the time. 
that it was not trickling down from a very particular rarefied couture sense of fashion, that I saw young women in the street dressing in a way that I thought was influencing the designers. Fashion was being influenced by all sorts of different people and culture and also, of course, the street. So I saw more as a trickle up rather than a trickle down influence. And when I came to Vogue, that's what I wanted it to reflect. Of course it became a trend, you know. I, I was mixing everything with real things that you wear every day. I love the street. No, no, take another pillow, take another pillow. It's good. No, no, it doesn't work. One, two, three, four. No, 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 behind, on the chair. Just throw, being bang. I do the best for the picture. I work <laughs> because I love. Is this fine no, to fit? Feet lovely. Okay. The frame looks good. You look good. This is what I want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Carleen. Oh, uh, well, Carleen. She's. <laughs> Carleen's quite something. Carlin is more is more, layer on the bangles. You know, this kind of flamboyant French aristocrat with a mouth like a trooper. I love to make cheap and expensive. I adore this. This is what you call the surf style. I mixed everything. This is my own salad. I was doing a sitting kind of breakfast at Tiffany's and I put a big Chanel bag under the... In the street, a lady comes and says, she have an evening dress. Why you give her a big bag? Well, I said, because it's the attitude. Everything is about attitude for me. She was the editor that had the brilliance to produce the very first cover that I ran on Vogue, which was that amazing La Croix Couture T-shirt with a embellished cross on it and a, a pair of guest blue jeans. Do you know, I remember when I've done the first issue for uh, Anna, I worked in Paris. And I said, if I put a jean with this divine T-shirt, it will be perfect. It's a street. You can wear couture in the street suddenly. It was not like, you know, you have to have the hair done, the makeup done to wear couture. So I put a jean with this famous Lacroix T-shirt. When the cover actually went off to the printers, they called the office and said, is it a mistake? They couldn't conceive that this actually could be a cover of Vogue magazine. I mean, why a scandal? Is that a scandal to put a couture with the jeans? I mean, perhaps it was scandalous for some people, not for me. That really took Vogue out of the studio and the strobe lights and literally into the streets and mixed things up. Me, I love the street. I love street. Adore, adore street. I love the street. Life is about mixing the thing and to be divine in the street. Voila. This was the idea of Peter. He wanted to do the white shirt. And you know, I love accessories. But me, I was in heaven. So we shot this in LA. The girl look, I mean, divine, divine. Easiness, real. Real. This can be today. It is no season. Style don't have season. Nothing is demodé when it's great pieces. Nothing, nothing, nothing is demodé. The picture came back and went straight to a draw. And when Anna arrived, I think six or eight months after, she said, oh, I absolutely adore, it's divine. This is what fashion is, this is the most modern thing. I have some dim recollection of finding it in a drawer and I can't remember why. It wouldn't run, but I mean, I, what I loved about that picture is that it just had so much um, joy in it. And looking back, you saw that picture as a sort of key moment when you looked at them not because of what they were wearing, but because of who they were. This was the beginning of a big deal. Well, Carlin might not have invented the supermodels, but she was shrewd enough to recognize the opportunity that they represented. The way fashion would become the stuff of gossip columns, entertainment news, and celebrity. It was that incredible moment in time where fashion photography and fashion design and the women all merged. 
It was a very, very high octane, va va voom, glitzy supermodel world. Oh, no supermodel questions, please. Oh, God. So. It was a sort of rat pack moment for the models. And, you know, they were all friends and they were being photographed everywhere they went and enjoyed it. I don't know why it happened. I just remember that at the time, a lot of actresses took a stance that they wanted to be taken seriously for their art. Oh, I'm a movie star. I don't want to, you know, demean myself by embracing fashion. I'm just going to wear, you know, dirty sneakers and a pair of jeans, and, but I'm a serious actress. So because we didn't have the actresses, we needed those superstars. We needed the supermodels, and they loved it. I mean, it was my life. Besides on the pages of Vogue, I wore it in real life. I like glamour. Not afraid of it. Bah, je suis super modèle parce que c'est c'est were, they were uh, absolutely divine girl who love fashion. It was a dream. Voilà. I think this is a turning point in my career. <laughs> this moment, um, the fashion world discovered grunge. I hate grunge. This was the worst period of my life because I hate grunge. God, I hope that never comes back. We had a lot of vintage kind of clothes, which is something that never appeared in American Vogue. This is pajamas. It was one of the first times I recall of having street fashion in, in Vogue. I remember that thinking that was so amazing to see a street style, a, a subcultural style represented in Vogue. I don't think I had any idea what I was getting into with that story. You know, she may have said grunge to me at that time, I probably blocked it out. But Grace is quite subtle with her. It's not even so much as she ever pitches me an idea. It's usually one word written on a piece of paper or I'm going to do this, Anna, and... And she keeps saying, oh, that grunge moment, that was such a bad moment. I mean, I can't see her walking around in a grunge, you know. <laughs> My grunge days are long gone. <laughs> but... That was such an important shoot, and it was, you know, you have to do something that's going to really make people sit up and think and be shocked and confused and angry and what is Vogue doing and cancelling their subscriptions. It's so raw. It is confrontational, but at the same time romantic. It's one of my favourite photographs. My first day at Vogue was very funny. I was called straight into a fashion meeting. The first thing that I heard was, it's all about the butterfly. It's about the butterfly necklace, the butterfly shoe, the butterfly bag, butterfly earrings or butterfly prints. It was all about the butterfly. <laughs> Throw your head back. Okay, come back, come back. Yes, beautiful. Okay, beautiful. Fashion to me is a reflection of culture. It's not just about whether everyone's wearing a trench coat. It's there to report on the world at large. A fashion editor tries, I suppose, to sense what is going on in the world. This is one of my favorite photo shoots. It was uh, The idea behind it was surveillance. There were more cameras going up on the streets. There were more cameras in shops. We rented a an apartment across from Condé Nast so we could film from one building into another. Camilla's genius is to take that perfect Vogue girl just caught unawares, you know, under surveillance, you know. We're all being watched at some point, but they could be chic while they're being watched. <laughs> as they should be. <laughs> there was an anti-prettiness and an anti-perfection. It was just capturing reality, which was counter to a lot of what Vogue represented. I'm constantly in a state of high anxiety. <laughs> this feels more, less, maybe more... <laughs> She anguishes about every sitting. Nothing is ever taken lightly. 
Because literally, as soon as they're coming on, I'll start shooting. Okay. Because I want that energy. Okay. I'm always hoping that on the day something happens and you just hope that it will fly, that it will become something that transcends time, that you will, you know, that you'll remember. Um, you, you hope that it poses a question. There is often a slightly dangerous undercurrent to what she does. That year, the collections, there were a vast amount of incredibly high heels that were sort of impossible to walk on. And so we wanted to sort of discuss, you know, how you became disabled by this. They're meant to indicate power and stature and they leave you immobile. <laughs> but I love wearing them myself. <laughs> yeah. It's so graphic. I think, you know, she's so tall and so, so beautiful up there. So framed and the light on the brace. Some people who were disabled found it offensive. I thought that it actually um, was sort of kind of quite handsome in a way. This was the last shoot at the plaza before it went into renovation. It was about photographing in non-spaces, hallways, elevators, the, the places in between. We were left basically alone in the plaza in its, in its shell, in its empty corridors. You know, she personifies New York, so does the plaza. It was so sort of Blade Runner in a way. It was a dream come true. Camilla wanted to be subversive, maybe a little bit sneaky, hide a message in the pages maybe mess with the institution a little bit. There's one shoot that I will never forget. When I was in the middle of working on it, I stood in the studio st surrounded by wooden ladders filled with feather boas and tables laid out with wigs. It was just a coat story, but there was something quite magical about it. It was just exactly as I dreamt a fashion studio would look like. That's the magic of walking into the planning room and looking at a shoot for the very first time is that you're, you know, you can be so surprised. And that's what one wants. One wants to be surprised. Of course, I'm nervous on every shoot. Even if I'm doing a still life of a mouse, I'm nervous. If I don't have a picture in my mind of the final image, then I know the sitting isn't going to work. Nothing is left to chance. Phyllis is very, very firm and determined, and, you know, she gets these extraordinary results. With Tebow, I need all the shorts, yeah. all the warm-up things. Yeah. Her role at the magazine is very, very different because other editors are doing epic 20-plus page stories, and you can tell a narrative. Phyllis, with her photographers, has to create a single image that is going to stop you in your tracks. In the sittings I do, we are illustrating an idea. It's skincare, it's health, it's diet, it's hair color. So one has to think of a way to surprise and make the reader stop and look and read the article. Now, this was the result of some new moisturizers, and they were all white and that's all I had to work with. And we got gallons of cream brought down from a dairy in upstate New York. She was sitting in a big tub. One of Penn's assistants stood over her and Penn would say, all right, go, and then he'd pour the cream on her head from a pitcher. We could do two or three, and then we'd have to clean her off and start over, and also give her a rest. You know, couldn't just torture her all day. She's so fastidious in her approach, and she's really the consummate performer.
perfectionist. I mean, if you're going to do a bee lighting on a lip to illustrate the concept of bee stung lips, Phil is, is really going to spend months visiting every apiary in the States, casting just the right bee and just the right pair of lips. So we imported some bees, which were live, and um, had a very brave model and put the bee on her lip. Oh, she was fearless. At one point, the bee was sitting on her mouth like that, and she just stuck out her tongue and had the bee on her tongue. The casting is very important in these pictures because you have to have somebody who is willing to sacrifice themselves, you know, for that picture. It's not good to have an unhappy model. We want them to be happy and feel beautiful. Seriously, I'm saying that like it's a joke, but it's really important like this. That needed a model who knew how she looked with a football on her face because she had to move her head or tilt it and her shoulders moved so that you felt that there was a person there and that it wasn't just a dead body. We were doing an article on fear of aging and we wanted two models that looked the same. They had an expression, but nothing moved and it looked kind of okay. So then Stephen said, why don't we try them without the faces? And when we took the faces off, that was the picture. They came from California and they were very, very expensive. And they come with interchangeable heads. Anna was either going to like it or hate it. Sometimes walking into the planning room, I'm shocked and, and I'll say we can never run these pictures. <laughs> They're too out there. We shot that with a real dermatologist and Anna felt that he was giving her a lethal injection. I didn't feel that way, but um, if she did, other people would. It's the first reaction is really important. I had to present every issue to the corporate floor, and I could see them having no concept that those were not real models. And that really was the, the surprise and the strength of those photographs, that you weren't quite sure. For decades, Phyllis really proved herself the perfect pen whisperer, and she was able to coax him to photograph people that he might have resisted. Penn hated movie stars because when he did a portrait, he really wanted to get past the face that the person presents to the public, and that's very difficult with actors. He kept saying no to photographing her. So we talked about it and talked about it, and he finally agreed to do a portrait of her another year later. I just remember climbing up the stairs to his studio. It was very, very quiet, and everyone sort of whispering. There couldn't be anyone else in the eyeline of the subject. We talked a little bit, but a lot of it is in how you communicate quietly without words. I was behind a curtain listening. I mean, they fell in love. It was so beautiful to watch it. And she just gave up all of that actor. I hated it. I looked at it and I said, oh, I really don't like that picture. And I sent it to my mother. And my mother called me back. And she said, Albert, why do you look so sad? And I understood at this moment that Irving Penn did not take a picture of me, but he x-rayed me. We can scan these guys, and then I'll just amend this one. You have to understand that with the great fashion editors that we have working at Vogue, it's not a job to them. It's who they are. And I think that's really maybe clearest in the case of Tony Goodman. And if I close my eyes and think about an American style, I would say Tony. She's all about stripping things away to their essence. You know, I didn't start out pursuing a career in fashion. I went to art school and I, was, I studied painting and drawing. Prior to that, I modeled when I was in high school with Mrs. Breland at Vogue. If you look at those pictures today, you see this clean, minimal, gorgeous young woman who couldn't be anything but a young American girl. My style is uh, very recognizable because it's founded on simplicity. 
a classic approach to dressing. A lot of it connects with my life. I wear a uniform essentially all the time. I wear, you know, white jeans, a shirt, flat shoes. The practicality that I require for my life shows up in the photographs, I think. And I think that that's probably one of the earmarks of American fashion. American fashion is very practical. This is a shoot with Stephen Klein. She is on the sidewalk putting something into a deposit slot of a bank. The car is on the sidewalk, aggressively positioned. I mean, it's all very right, it's very sharp. It's very minimal and yet very emotional. It's an emotional picture in its very cold way. You wouldn't think it's emotional, but I find it very, emo I think it's, it's one of my favorites actually. I really adore this, this photograph. Here's another example of it. There's nothing random about his photograph. It is not a frivolous moment. It really is a frozen moment, literally. Time is such a precious part of our life. And to be able to freeze a moment, whether it is conjured or whether it's spontaneous, is a kind of a gift. Tony does represent really the heart of the American woman. And she understands that particular American aesthetic. Don't forget, a lot of the editors at uh, Vogue are British. So I'm the American editor. And I do a lot of the very classic things for Vogue because it's, it's the kind of niche that they need me for. But I can, I can do other things, actually. When I came there in 99, most of the covers were models. And between two... 2000 and 2002, it did a complete flip. It's a completely different ball game, photographing with a celebrity than it is with a model. Dealing with celebrities, you, you know, you just need to be uh, very calm. <laughs> she can take the most demanding celebrity and turn them into a Vogue cover in a way that nobody else can. Gaga has such a strong sense of herself. She was a perfect candidate for a power issue. I think it's fair to say there was a little bit of a buzz about Lady Gaga. So it was arranged that she would come in and meet some editors and meet Anna. There was a lot of um, toing and froing about the appointment, and I thought, oh my goodness, she's going to be late. You know, it's one of those people that are always late. But she arrived on the dot, and she was dressed like a nun in a full white cotton robe. And she just had a little hat on that said Vogue on it. With the G kind of framing her face and the U and the E going off in this direction. The V and the O here. Um, so I really thought this girl means business. <laughs> a few months later, she was on the cover for the first time. So she said, there, somehow I would like to make a kind of subtle reference to Vogue magazine and Anna Wintour. And if you notice, you can't say it doesn't look like Anna. The hair is like Anna. I adore this photograph. I think it captures her and it captures Vogue. Oh. Well, it just, it just it looks so ugly. Is there a boy or a girl? It's a girl. It's Lady Gaga. But I don't think it's sexy at all. You? Let me see it again. It's interesting. You know how old I am, a hundred next year. The look that I had then with my hair was very simple. Her hair scraped unforgivingly back into a tight little sort of ballerina chignon and pearls. You know, I've had them for, for, for as long as I can remember. And a sort of impeccable, understated, elegant style. I very often had a bird on my head. Live bird. I used to sit in the corner and do needlework. Otherwise, you'd go crazy with boredom, you know, because some photographers took forever. She's very self-effacing and says so she just sat back in, in the corner quietly doing her needlepoint, but I think there's a little bit more to it than that because the pictures are really potent. It's not just a beautiful girl standing there perfectly dressed in front of the camera. The day we got there, she didn't show up. We waited and waited and waited and waited and waited and waited and finally went to Disneyland. <laughs> and she did show up the next day and she was perfect from then on. 
But there was this terrible hairdresser who kept giving her ice water, which turned out to be vodka. <laughs> she was obviously somebody doomed, and of course, as, we, as you well know, she was dead within the month. really love having our picture taken. Hey, Camilla, you get to be bad girl again. Right. <laughs> you're my favorite bad girl. She, she's the new bad girl. You're, you're the, you're the, the <laughs> I'm original the bad girl. You're the original bad girl. And down low. I'm so honored and, um, and shy. I have been summoned. It'll be an amazing photograph. Preserving a moment is magic. Holly, we wish you here. I know. Elbow, just elbow her. <laughs> What kind of a family are they? Um, when I first came to Vogue, the fashion department was possibly one of the most alarming places on the planet. Okay, hang in there, hang in there. I mean, Polly Merlin and Carleen Surf. Such formidable characters. Win! <laughs> they were very, very, very much larger than life, flamboyant, opinionated women I haven't even got to grace. It is a family. It is a family. It's a slight dysfunctional family, but it's also a very close and warm and loving family. Tears. Oh, are you going for a Barbara Walters moment? <laughs> genius is the word I would use. They all have genius in them and they all have a deep, deep understanding of what makes a great photograph. Thank you very much. That was very, very nice. Are you Peace Corps? Oh, no, not at all. We're Vogue. Vogue, Vogue. Vogue. It's all about the butterfly. The butterfly. The butterfly. It's all about the butterfly. limousines worth of Dior's, hats, shoes. I mean, I really thought she was going to punch me and screamed, you know, how dare you, how dare you, how dare you, how dare you. Punch me, punch me, punch me, punch me. It's all about the butterfly. The butterfly, the butterfly. It's all about the butterfly. The butterfly, the butterfly. But everything's fashion. I mean, your fashion. This is from Street. Street. I mean, your fashion. Street. That needed a model who knew how she looked with a football on her face. Real. Real. I very often had a bird on my head. I can, I can do other things. No, sorry. <laughs> you can't make me that. Is there a boy or a girl? It's, it's all about the butterfly. The butterfly, the butterfly. It's all about the butterfly. Nothing is demoté when it's great pieces, 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 pieces. Nothing, nothing, nothing is demoté. Voilà, voilà, voilà. Easiness, real, real, real. It's all about the butterfly. The butterfly, the butterfly. It's all about the butterfly. The butterfly, the butterfly. It's all about the butterfly. The butterfly, the butterfly. It's all about the butterfly. It's all about the butterfly. The butterfly, butterfly. It, it, it's all about the butterfly. The butterfly, butterfly.